It's Sunday night, and we are talking about prophecy on Sunday night. At the end of time, there's going to be Israel coming back together into one nation. There were two nations in the Old Testament that was under Solomon, the son of David, where Solomon allowed his wives to keep all of their their Shemash gods, that is the sun gods of, of Moab. They were allowed to keep their Ashtaroth, or O-T-H. Ashtaroth was female deities. It was the tree goddesses. Tree. Always the tree was represented upon the earth by the Lord Moon. Well, I thought the tree goddess was a female. Well, it is. But in the, in the uh, Arabic countries, she was worshipped uh, as a uh, male, female god or goddess. They were androgynous, A-N-D-R-O-G-E-N-O-U-S. Androgynous is the same thing that we say when we say hermaphrodite. I guess that's the way you spell hermaphrodite. A hermaphrodite means male and female. That's somebody that's birthed. They have the male and the female genitalia. Androgynous means basically the same thing among these gods. Well, the tree goddess was always represented in the form of a crescent moon and when you go over there to when you go to the uh, far east and the middle east you'll find that all of these all of these nations this is Israel right here uh, well let me back up on that all these people in the ancient world all the people over here in this land east of Israel, east, east would be back this way, all these people worship the Lord Moon. In fact, Lebanon is directly above Israel. One of the titles for the, for the uh, moon goddess was Lebanah, L-E-B-A-N-A-H. And that's a form of the spelling of the, in the temple, when they would put this, this uh, frankincense, frankincense on the golden altar to offer a sacrifice up to God in the Holy of Holies, this frankincense was a form of Lebanon. It nearly spelled the same way, and it meant white. Now, I have a theory, and I kind of believe this, uh, that we get the word white people from this moon worship that they did. I've wondered why white people think they're better than black people, and they do in most areas of our society. Uh, the white people are not white. That's not white on my hand. That's pinkish tan on my hand. It's more pink than and tan than white. And I believe that they were called white people because they worshipped the moon gods over there in, in uh, the Arab lands. When I say Arab, Arab is a... I use the word in general because it's a Hebrew word. It is the word Arab, and it means a mixed race. Arab people are not pure. There are no pure races on the face of the earth. Everybody's intermarried over thousands of years. I don't know why, why white people think that they're better than blacks because uh, I've got a sociology book said they have studied sociology and studied the blood that's in people this one lady went down to uh, New Orleans to get her a uh, and get her a, a birth certificate 
and she found out that she had black ancestors in her background, so they made her start calling herself a black person. And they said in this sociology book that about 86% of all white Americans have black ancestors in their background. So most of us are actually black people. <laughs> by, by the way, people, if you have a little bit of black in you, they consider you black. So most of us are actually black people. So nobody has a right to march or in a racial situation. Now, I believe it. I believe that's true. Now, most of the white people were over here between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. This right here is called the Caucasus Mountains. You see, C A U C A S U S Mountains. This is where the Assyrians were seated. And the Assyrians were the descendants of Japheth. Japheth. And Japheth is the firstborn son of Noah. Japheth. And they, most of their, their ancestry is up here. Now the Assyrians were the Caucasians. And I'm going to try to tie this in with Ezekiel. Well, I'm going to tie it in with Ezekiel the the tw the uh, 38th chapter because we're going to talk about Japheth's descendants we're going to talk about Shem's descendants and we're going to talk about Ham's descendants Ham's now the Caucasus Mountains is here uh, between the Black Sea the Black Sea is on the very southern part of what we used to call the Soviet Union, that's Russia up there now. Uh, the Soviet Union dissolved in the early 90s. What that means is all the states that made up the Soviet Union were dissolved and became independent states. Now, I'm going to talk about all of these areas here, the Caucasus Mountains. The word Gog, Gog. I heard about Gog and Magog when I was a little kid. And every time the preachers would teach on Gog and Magog, they'd say, that's Russia. And that's, that's Russia, and they're going to attack us one day. Well, they probably won't attack us, but they will attack, possibly attack Israel. And we're going to see that in the 38th chapter of Ezekiel. Now, I'm going to read something to you. It comes out of the McClintock and Strong. This is the set of encyclopedias. When I tell you these have got so much information in them, you really need to research in them. When you get over there to the 38th chapter of Ezekiel, it's going to talk about Gog and Magog. Where does that come from? I heard that Gog and Magog was the Antichrist at the end of time when I was a little boy. Has anybody ever heard that? Gog and Magog. It's the Antichrist and the Antichrist system. Well, it is... But it's more than just a system of Gog and Magog. When you open up this, this is a Cyclopedia Biblical Ecclesiastical and Theological Literature by John McClinic and James Strong. You've got Magog right here, and it'll tell you all about it. Let me do this. Studying this is like getting together in a lab and saying, here's this part, here's this part, here's this part. Let's turn over to Ezekiel, the 38th chapter. Let's kind of look at this together. Now, Ezekiel says in verse 1, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man. The word of the Lord is Jesus, isn't it? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by the Word, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us in John the first chapter. Well, the Word is Jesus. So pre-incarnate, before He was incarnate in flesh, the Word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, and the land of Magog. Well, who in the world is this? They were just like us. They named their lands after themselves is what they did. We need to go back over here to Genesis, the 10th chapter. 
This is the map that I gave you right here. I gave you a map. It comes out of one of the oldest books I've got in my library. It's not, not ancient, but it was the one of the first books I bought in about 60 or 61 when I started really trying to get in studying. And it was the Zondervan's Pictorial Dictionary in one volume. Now, I've got a five-volume set of Zondervan. They've increased it that much. And I have never found this map anywhere except in that one Zondervan book. This is very important. Huh? I couldn't find it online either when I was looking for it. Couldn't find it? It's amazing. It's amazing because it's, it explains this is a picture of the 38th chapter of Ezekiel right here. And it is a picture of the 10th chapter of the tenth chapter of Genesis. Go over to the tenth chapter of Genesis ten. You got another copy of that? Dave's coming yeah, in. There's copies right there on the back. Okay. Now Genesis ten. Genesis ten is called the Table of Nations. And the reason it's called the Table of Nations is because after the flood, now the flood ends in Genesis 9, Noah comes out of the ark. The flood, Noah's given instructions in the 6th chapter of Genesis to build an ark. The flood comes in the 7th and 8th chapter. The flood is up on the earth for 370 days. Now, it rained 40 days and 40 nights, but the flood was here uh, for well over a year. Noah was in the ark. Uh, with a bunch of animal dung and stink and smell and nobody got to shower or bathe for 370 days. Now, that's a trial, isn't it? Ooh, don't think I'd want to be in there. Now, when the, when the flood is over, God puts his rainbow in the cloud in Genesis, the ninth chapter, saying, I will never destroy you again by water. But he didn't say... I wasn't going to bring fire upon you and heat upon you, which I believe the earth is heating up because in this 15th chapter of Revelation, we find God bringing the earth, heats up the earth, and men are cursing God for the heat, and they refuse to repent. Well, after the flood, in the ninth chapter, they come out of the ark. They land on the mountains of Ararat. When they come out of the ark, the 10th chapter is the table of nations. This is where the sons of Noah migrated to. They land on the mountains of Ararat. Ararat is a chain of mountains in eastern, what we call Turkey. Here's Turkey right here. In eastern Turkey, the mountains of Ararat. Turkey's got some of the greatest church history than any, than any place in the scripture because all the seven churches of Asia are here, over here on the Western Turkey, Galatia is a state right in the middle of Turkey. And Paul was going to all of these places preaching on his first missionary journey. And he went, goes back over to Jerusalem after his first journey. His second journey goes up here through Lystra and over here to Ephesus and goes over to what we would call up here in the northern part of the Aegean Sea, right up here where my finger is, that's where... Philippi and Thessalonica were. So that's his second journey. And then he ends up down here in Athens and Corinth and so forth. And then he comes back over here. Well, this map here is going to show you the. this is the table of nations according to Genesis, the 10th chapter. These are the ancient names for these nations. Instead of Turkey, uh, they've got Meshach. They've got Tiras and Tubal, if you'll notice that on your map. These are the nations that's supposed to attack Israel at the end of time. I'm going to say this before I forget. These nations, as such, have never collectively come together and attacked Israel. Individually, they've attacked Israel. Syria, Syria attacked Israel. We know that happened many times. Uh, Ben-Hadad was the king of Syria when they would come down against Jehoshaphat and attack Jehoshaphat or attack northern Israel when they had their various kings. So 
we know they've attacked Israel. We know that that all of these empires here have attacked Israel, but they haven't collectively come together, and that's what the 38th chapter says, that, that at the end of time, they're going to attack Israel. Now, I believe the attack upon Israel will be twofold. I believe since we are spiritual Israel, we are spiritual Israel, they will attack us, and I believe America is already under attack in the pulpits with false doctrine. I believe the church is under attack right now. I got a paper from somebody. I forget who it was. I wish I'd have brought it with me. And they said that they're trying to come up and implement this fairness doctrine uh, in, in all of the various papers and, and uh, media that we have, the Internet and so forth. They're trying to implement this fairness doctrine so everybody can have their own religion and worship the way they want to worship. And you can have your religion as long as you don't give somebody else a hard time. But the way we believe the Bible, we have to call down the lies and the liars. And that would be just about everybody out there, everybody from Kenneth Copeland to T.D. Jakes to, to Charles Stanley to all these Southern Baptists, all the Pentecostals and Charismatics, I have to call them down because they're lying about the Bible. Now, I've got to, let's read a little bit here in the 10th chapter. In the 10th chapter of, of Genesis. All right. Here are the sons. This is where the sons of Noah when they landed on the mountain of Ararat, I don't know exactly where it is. It's over here in eastern Turkey. This is Turkey right here. Mounds of Ararat. When they landed, the sons of Japheth came up here to the Caucasus area, the Caucasus Mountains. The word Gog comes from the word Caucasus. Caucasus. It's a hardening of the the A-U, Gok, Ka, is a hardening of the consonants, Gog. The Caucasus Mountains are here. And so they're going to be leaders in the rebellion against Israel. Of course, Iran is right down here. And the Caucasus Mountains are just below Iran, so you might consider them a part of Persia. And Iran is Persia. Ancient Iran is Persia. Ancient Iraq is Babylon. You see the Euphrates River running here, the Tigris here, and they run together just, just above the Persian Gulf. So the Bible teaches us that all these nations collectively are going to go against Israel in the 38th chapter of, of uh, Ezekiel. Now look here. In the 10th chapter of Genesis... Now, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem is the second born, but he received the blessing of God. The Bible says, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem in the previous chapter in verse 26. But it wasn't said about Japheth. It says Japheth was the elder in the 21st verse of the 10th chapter. It says that Ham was the youngest when the Bible says Noah saw what his younger son had done in the 24th verse of the ninth chapter. So Ham is the youngest, Shem is the second born. That falls right in line with all those second borns being blessed and the first born being rejected. Now, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Shem, Shem's descendants moved from this mountains of Ararat down here into what we would call Iraq or somewhere on the Euphrates River in Babylon. This is why the Lord had to call Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. Whenever you see Chaldees, Chaldees was a term, Chaldeans was a term for Babylonians. Babylonians, and some say it's the mountains, and some say that the Chaldeans were the wise men of Babylon. Now, 
All right, let me continue reading here. And the sons of Japheth were Gomer and Magog. So these are actually children of Japheth. Gomer, let's look over here at this other map. I don't know any way to do this and just go slow. Let me get back over here. All right. Sons of Japheth were Gomer. Now, in one map, it's got Gomer down here, and it's got Gomer up here, but it could be that Gomer wraps around the Black Sea. So, Gomer, that's a son of Japheth. So, that would be in Russia. And then, Magog. Magog is here in this area here. That would be in the upper area either just above Syria, so you have to match up who these are today. That would be right above here, between the Caspian Sea, right up under the Caucasus Mountains. Then he says, and Madai, these are sons of Japheth, Madai and Jabin and Tubal and Meshach and Teros. These are all sons. Meshach, Tubal, Tiras, this is Turkey. But you're not going to know that unless you have a map that shows you that, are you? Well, that's why they call this the Table of Nations. It's where the sons of Noah migrated to. And Madai, where did we get Madai up there? All right. Here it is right here. There's Madai. There's no way to identify this without a map and without looking at the 10th chapter of Genesis. And Javan, Javan, that's over here, these islands off the western end of Turkey, or what they called Asia Minor. Now, and Meshach and Tiras, and the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, and Raphath and Togarma. Now, Togarma, the Bible's going to mention Togarma is going to be in this attack upon Israel. This is Israel right here, but it was the old ancient land of Canaan or the Philistines. It doesn't have Israel yet because these are the ancient names of the people that occupied this. Now, what did I say was looking for? We're looking for Tubal, Meshach, and Tiras and the sons of Gomer, not Gomer Pyle, but same word, Ashkenaz, Riphath, and Togarma. Now, Togarma, where do we have Togarma here? Huh? Right under, right under Tubal. Okay, Togarma's right here. So that would just be above Syria. We've got to look at where these nations are. Because these are the nations that's going to collectively get together and attack Israel. We seem to have that problem over there right now. We've got war over there because Israel is occupying that land. They were made a nation, May 14, 1948. So this has given us an ancient picture of the sons of Japheth attacking Israel. Well, Israel comes out of Shem. They... Abraham migrates down into what we would call Iraq, or Iraq comes from Erek, uh, and it means ruler, or one who rules. My son's name, Eric, comes from Erek. And here's Babel, this is Iraq in here. So Abraham goes down here, and, and he goes down into the land of Ur, or Babylon, or the land of Haran. And he's called out of there to go to Israel and to become the father of the Jews in Israel. But before that, they were the Philistines, or they were the ancient people of the old world. Then you see here, now when the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration from God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, it means chapter 10 is very profitable if you're going to study the 38th chapter of Ezekiel, because you're going to see these people attacking Israel. 
Well, that's the very people that are wrestling with Israel today, isn't it? It's the same people under a different name. Iraq, Iran, Turkey, uh, these states up here that used to be actually Armenia, which is, they're all Arab nations. The Bible says they're going to attack Israel at the end of time. It looks like they're loading up for that right now. And like I said before, the only reason they don't attack them is because Israel is loaded to the hilt with nuclear warheads. But the old president of Iraq, I can't remember his name, I called his name out a lot, and he said he was going to make a preemptive attack on Israel as soon as Iran gets, gets nuclear power. Well, they've got the missiles... They just don't have the nuclear warheads. When they get the nuclear warheads, a preemptive attack means I'm going to attack them without any provocation because they've taken the land of our brothers who are Arab people and they've stolen it from them. I keep telling you, all this goes together. In 1517, the Ottoman Turks, this is the Turkish Empire up here, the Ottoman Turks began to rule Israel, Ottoman, and it was an empire. And they ruled to 1917 when the Ottoman Empire was overthrown at the end of World War I. Except they didn't call it World War I. Why is that? They never had had a World War II yet. They didn't know they were going to have one. So they call that the Great War. In 1917, a General Allenby of the British Commonwealth. General Allenby got off his horse, walked in Jerusalem, said he was not worthy to conquer Jerusalem upon a horseback. So he walked in Jerusalem and declared Jerusalem a part of the British Empire, the British Commonwealth. Now, what I want us to do is read more and see these people in here. I want to identify these people as to who they are. Let's read a little more here. And the sons of Javan, Elisha, Tarshish. We've got Tarshish up there somewhere. Got it up there. Had it on. Uh, sometimes it's awful hard to see all these things. I need to review it. you got Gergesites, Hittites, so all of these people here. Huh? Oh, Tarshish over here, that's a question mark. They're not sure that's Tarshish. So if they got a question mark, they're not sure. They know these people over here. Then he goes on to say, the sons of Javan, Tarshish, Kittim, Dodonim, by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands. Gentile means everybody's not a Jew. So all of the descendants of Japheth or the Caucasus people, the Caucasians, would be uh, Gentiles. Japheth would be Gentiles. They were all Caucasians. And after their families, their nations, and the sons of Ham, Cush, Mizraim, Phut, and Canaan. Well, that's easy to find. Put, Mizraim, Canaan. These were the descendants of Ham here. Canaan. Mizraim, Put, Foot, Cush. Cush would be down here in the area of what we call Ethiopia. So all of these people are going to somehow come up with a massive collective army to attack Israel according to the 38th chapter of Ezekiel. And it has never happened before where they've got a confederacy to do that. Never happened. They've individually attacked Israel, but not total, not completely collectively. Then let's read a little more. The sons of Ham, Cush, Mizraim, Phut, and Canaan. The sons of, you want to know where Canaan comes from? This is it right here. And Canaan, the Canaanites were dri driven out by Joshua. They were supposed to be driven out, but they didn't drive them out. And uh, they were sons of Ham. And the sons of Cush, Sheba, and Havilah, 
and Sabata and Rayaman and Sabteka and the sons of Ramon, Sheba, and Dedan. Dedan is down here. Down here on the bottom, Dedan. On some of the maps it shows it down here. Dedan. Oh, here it is. Dedan right here. Dedan. I've had seen it on some maps down here. Some of the map makers are doing the best they can, but they cannot, they don't have exact, uh, they don't have an exactness in their understanding on the maps where they are, but they have an approximate. And Cush begat Nimrod. Now this is Ham's lineage. Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He's the one that started Babylon. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. It means against the Lord. It don't mean in front of the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. Shinar in Genesis 11, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and all of this area of Euphrates and Babylon was the land of Shinar. So they built, they built these, these Nimrud temples, N-I-M-R-U-D, and you can look up Nimrod in McClinic and Strong. It'll give you all kinds of information on it. You can get an education out of McClinic and Strong encyclopedias. Now, these were, this was the land of Shinar here. They've got Babel here on the Euphrates River. This is approximately where Babel was. That's where the ruins of Nimrod were located by the archaeologists back in the 1800s. Well, that's, here's Babel. Here's Iraq. These are all the beginning of Nimrod's empire. This is the Mediterranean Sea. goes all the way out through the Strait of Gibraltar. And Israel is on the eastern end of the Mediterranean. And they're the only ones that God came to. And nobody else had the truth. All the rest were Gentiles. Iraq, uh, Ashkenaz. These are all descendants of the three sons of, of Nimrod. I mean of uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then he says, The beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. When you look over there in Genesis 11, and the whole earth was of one language and one speech, that's the first verse, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. This is the beginning of Babel where Nimrod starts it. And they said one to another, Go to or come now, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they, and they had brick for stone and slime for mortar. And they said, Come now, let us, go to means come now. Let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven and let us make us a name. That's the doctrine of the Babylonian system itself. Lest we be scattered or brought upon the face of the earth. And this is where all the languages begin to be confused. In their pride, the Lord said, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from their imagination. It says, From them which they have imagined to do. And out of this comes Christmas and Halloween and Easter and all the rest of the sun and tree goddesses came out of this system right here. Now, go back to verse 11 of chapter 10. And out of the land went forth Asher, we get the word Assyria from that, and builded Nineveh and the city of Rehoboth and Kalna. Nineveh is right about where Baghdad is in the ancient world. Kalna is up here. That's one of the first cities of Nimrod. Baghdad is here and right about there. And Baghdad was the city of Nineveh. It was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire of the land of Gog and Magog. Now, let's continue to read. 
Do you think there's any reason to study this? Every reason in the world if you're going to understand that 38th chapter of Ezekiel. And Rezin beget between Nineveh and Calna, the same is a great city. And Mizraim, who's one of the sons of Gomer, what was it, Gomer? Uh, Mizraim, one of the sons, oh, uh, yep. huh? Oh, of Ham, of Ham. Mizraim, one of the sons of Ham, in verse 6. Uh, where did I leave off? 13. Begat Ludim and Anamim and Lahabim and Naphtuhim and Pathrusim and Kasluhim, out of whom came the Philistines. Ah. So this is where the Philistines started. They came out of Cush. And Kaphtorim. And Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn. What was Sidon? The capital city of what we call Lebanon, right above Israel. And Sidon was one of the cities. And Tyre was one of the cities of what they called in the ancient world Tyre and Sidon. And out of Tyre and Sidon comes comes Baal in the grove when when Ahab marries Jezebel. Ahab marries Jezebel and her father was the prince of Tyre or Sidon. When you said Tyre and Sidon, that was like they were two cities, but they were like the same, saying the same thing. They promulgated and promoted the fire and tree worship in the form of Baal and the grove and tree worship. And this comes out of Cush, out of Ham. So you've got rebellion coming out of Ham, and you're going to have rebellion coming out of Japheth. Because Japheth is the Caucasus, Caucasian tribes, and Ham is where the Negroid uh, race goes back to. So one's not better than the other for sure. If anybody's bad, it was those Japhethites. They were barbarians and slaughters and butchers. Then Canaan begat Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth. And the Jebusite, we said this morning that in that 10th, 11th chapter of First Chronicles, David said, whoever goes in and conquers Jebus, which was the land of the Jebusites, which later on became Jerusalem, whoever conquers that will be my commander-in-chief. And that was his nephew, that was his nephew, Joab, that went in there and conquered him. And the Jebusite and the Amorite and the Gergesite. Now, when you study the Amorites, the historians will tell you everybody that was in the land of Israel or Canaan, when, when, uh, when Israel comes out of Egypt, crosses the Red Sea and comes up here, that all the people were called Amorites. And Amorite included the Jebusites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and all the Ites were, had one common title, either Amorites or Canaanites. And these were sons... These were sons, uh, sons of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. That's where it all goes back to. Let me finish reading some of this. I'm not going to read all, the whole chapter because it's hard to get to all of it. And the, where did I let off? And the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite. Now I always think when I see these ites, I think of, of, uh, Joshua, not Joshua, Judges, the third chapter, where Israel did not drive out all these people. So God says, I'm going to turn you over to them, and they're going to teach you to war. And he had all, a lot of these people listed in there. The, and the Arvidite and the Zemurite and the Hamathite, and afterward were the families of the Canaanites spread abroad. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, which is a part of what we call uh, just above Israel, Lebanon, or the old ancient 
system of Tyre and Sidon. As thou comest to Gerir into Gaza, into Gaza, Gaza, the Gaza Strip, is the southwest corner of Israel. That was the land of the Philistines, and they are descendants of descendants of Cush, who is a descendant of Ham. Ham. Philistines. Now, let's continue reading here. Was I, the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, verse 19, as thou comest to Gerir, into Gaza. And thou goest into the Gaza Strip is the same thing as the land of the Philistines. It's also the same thing as the land of the Anakims, where the giants lived. And, of course, one of those giants was Goliath. And Gomorrah, and uh, to Gaza, as thou goest into Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adama and Zeboim unto Lasha. These are the sons of Ham after their families, after their tongues, in their countries and in their nations. Unto Shem. Out of Shem we get Semitic or Shemitic. And these were the descendants of, of Shem, who was the second born son of Noah second born of Noah and from Shem you go all the way down to Abraham Isaac and Jacob Jacob's name was changed to Israel and we get the word Shemitic from the word Shem and a Semite was someone who believed in Israel under the lineage of Shem Isaac Jacob whose name was changed to Israel so this is Jacob's ancestry right here. I'm not going to read all of it. Unto Shem also the father of the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth the elder. Japheth was the oldest. Ham was the youngest. That makes Shem the second born. And he matches up with all the second borns in the Old Testament that were blessed. Jacob was second born. Abel was second born. You got them all through the Old Testament. They receive a blessing. And the children of Shem, Elam, Asher, and Arphaxed. You find in the 11th chapter of Genesis, Genesis 11, you find Shem begets a son. His name is Arphaxed. Arphaxed. And the lineage goes through our facts and not these other sons of Shem. Through our facts, and the children of Aram, Uz, Ho, and Gether, and Mash. And our facts and beget Salah. That's the lineage. You see, they all had all these sons, Salah. And you'll find this in Genesis 11. It'll take you right down to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And unto Eber were born two sons. Salah begat Eber. This is the, or Eber, however you want to pronounce it. Eber. And this is the lineage that I bring out to you so often in, the, in this 11th chapter. You can see these Man, if you kind of take your eyes off that and go to the 11th chapter of Genesis and look down here in verse 10. These are the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old when he begat Arphaxed. Two years after the flood and Shem lived after he begat Arphaxed, 500 years, and begat sons and daughters. And Arphaxed lived five and 30 years and begat Salah. Back up to verse 24 of chapter 10, Salah begat Eber. And it says that in verse 13, in or verse 14 of chapter 11, Saul lived 30 years and begat Eber. This is the righteous lineage of God here. I believe the covenant goes through these sons, not through all the rest of these sons. People have said, well, do all these guys, are these the only ones born? No, they have all kinds of sons, and their sons have sons. When you back up to verse 24, our facts have begat Saul, and Saul begat Eber, and Eber... To Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg. Well, that's the next one in the line. When you look down here in chapter 11, and 
Eber Beget Peleg in verse 17. So it doesn't go through the other sons, just Peleg. For in the days was in the earth divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. But Joktan is not in the promise of God. You have to look at chapter 11 to look at the promise of God. Then he says, Joktan beget Almodad, and Shelaf, and Hazar Mavath, and Jerah, and, and Hadoram, and Uziel, Uzel, and Dikla, and Obel, and Abimael, and Sheba. And it goes on, takes you down, till you get down. These are the sons of Shem from their families, in verse 31. After their tongues and their lands, after their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah, after their generations, in their nations. And by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. Now let's go back over to Ezekiel 38. We've kind of looked at the family here. And we've recognized some of them as being in the lineage of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now go back over here to Ezekiel. Is there any need to read that? Absolutely. You can't even begin to understand Ezekiel at all. Especially the 38th chapter, you cannot understand unless you look at the 10th chapter of the Table of Nations. Now... Look here in Ezekiel 38. Ezekiel 38. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog. Magog is one of the sons of Japheth, isn't he? Now, Against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. I've done some research. Meshech and Tubal are in all the ancient uh, empires of the world. In Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. In the Babylonian lion, the Persian bear, the Grecian leopard, led by Alexander the Great, and the beast with iron teeth, which is Rome that devours all the others in its battle against him, iron teeth. And Meshach and Tubal was in every one of these empires. What would be the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal? It wouldn't be a Caesar. It'd be Satan. The chief prince, or the, the word is Rosh. It don't mean the Russian prince. I've heard preachers say, well, the Rosh, it's the word Rosh in the Hebrew, and it means the Russian prince. No, it doesn't. It means the head prince of Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. The head prince would be Satan himself. Satan. Now let's keep reading here. And I hope I'm covering it slow enough. Meshach and Tubal. Meshach is sitting right there in the middle of Galatia where the Gauls all sat. The Galatia comes from the word Gaul. Had a lot of the Gauls settle over here in Spain. Some of them settled over in here. The Gauls come in here and settle in this area. Galatia was a state right in the center of Turkey. So Meshach is right in the middle of Galatia. The chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, Tobolsk, Russia, Tobolsk, T-O-B-O-S-K, T-O-B-O-L-S-K. Tobolsk, Russia is right up here in this area in here, probably named after Tubal. So we're talking about the nations around Israel that's threatening Israel right now. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog. Well, who is Gog? Well, let me read something to you. I copied it out of, not word for word, but I put, I put it in common words. This is the G volume. Look up Gog in here. Let me read it to you off of a paper I wrote years ago. 
As to the signification of Gog, Gog is derived from the title of ancient pagan heathen kings called Agag. You remember Agag? Agag was a title. We get Gog from that. Agag was a title of the kings when Saul was told to go down to Amalek, just down here in just below Israel, in that uh, I don't want to turn away from that, but just below Israel in the Sinai Desert down here, the Amalekites were the ones that had attacked Israel when they came out of Egypt, uh, when they exited Egypt, and without provocation they attacked them. And 200 years later, God is telling Samuel to tell Saul, go down and destroy the Amalekites. The kings of the Amalekites were called Agags. That was a title just like Caesar. Just like Caesar, Agag was a title. Let me read this to you. As to the signification of Gog, it appears to mean mountain. Gog means mountain. You've got two mountains in Scripture that are spoken of. A mountain was a capital city of an empire. You can find that under Mount in the McLennan Strong. Capital city of an empire. You have Babylon, which God says was a proud mountain in the 50th and 51st chapter of Jeremiah. A proud mountain. God says you're a destroying mountain. How are they a destroying mountain? Because they took their doctrine of self, let us make us a name, and they've, they've destroyed the world who has partaken of this wine of her fornication when they go after self. After let us make us a name. God says, I'm going to make you a burnt mountain. So all through the Bible, you got one mountain... One mountain opposing another. You have Zion, which is God's mountain. And God told Ezekiel, go speak to the mountains of Zion and Moriah. You have Zion and you have Babylon, the destroying mountain. So whenever you find something that means mountain, it goes along with Babylon, which Gog was meant a mountain or a ruling system of an empire. Let me read some more of this. It appears to mean mountain, Caucasus, the Caucasus, C-A-U-C-A-S-U-S, C-A-U-S-A-S-U-S. The Caucasus Mountains, that's where the Caucasians get their name. There's a chain of mountains right between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. If this little uh, rectangle wasn't here, you'll see a chain of mountains going through it. It was the Caucasus Mountains. That was the, where the Assyrians were. They were the most barbaric people that ever lived upon the face of the earth. Prior to them was the Scythians. They lived on horseback, and they were butchers. I don't know where in the world Caucasians think they're better than other people. They're crazy. And I believe the world is full of Caucasians, and they're crazy. That's who's ruling America, and they don't have good sense. There's none of them talking about a daily cross and self-denial. Let me read the rest of this. The Caucasus comes from the Persian Ko, K-O-H. They just simply hardened that consonant, mountain, meaning mountain. The ascetic is Gog, A-S-S-E-T-I-C, O-S-S, E-T-I-C is G O. G-H-O-G-H, G-H-O-G-H, Gog, i.e. mountain. Even classical name Caucasus is originated from Kokaf, K-O-H-K-A-F, K-O-H-K-A-F, Kokaf. Since Caucasus was the chief seat of the Scythian are the Assyrian people. You study the Assyrians and the Scythians, that's the most barbaric people that ever walked on the earth. 
they slaughtered and butchered with no mercy. One of the writers said the Syrians, the Assyrians, not Syrians, Syria is right above Israel. The Assyrians were an empire that Israel, uh, that uh, Babylon overthrew. Caucasus originated, Kharkov, since Caucasus was the chief seat of the Scythian or Assyrian people. These people settled in the Caucasus Mountains directly north of Israel in the upper Mesopotamian Valley. At, or excuse me, upper Mesopotamia and further north between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, which is currently called Armenia or Georgia. That's what we, well, our state of Georgia is up there. This is called Georgia up in this area since they've uh, dissolved the Soviet Union. Soviet Union was a, was a bunch of countries that were numbered in the Union of the Soviet Social Republic. When they dissolved, all those nations kind of just dissolved away. Some of them didn't dissolve. Some of them ended up with despots ruling them. A despot is a a despot is a barbarian uh, ruler over a nation, and they'll kill anybody that gets in their way. Like who was the guy down there in the in uh, Haiti, Baby Doc, wasn't that his name, Baby Doc? The guy would slaughter and butcher, every, butcher everybody. He ended up going, I believe, to Africa trying to get some uh, some protection there. I don't know whatever happened to him. I think somebody killed him. Then they go on to say, further north between the Black Sea and the, the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, which is currently called Armenia or Georgia, a state of the now defunct Soviet Union. The hardening of the last sound, H, into G, Gog from Ka, seems to have taken place earlier and when the name had already become that of a people, the other names Magog and Agag arose. Another explanation comes from the pelvic Koka, K-O-K-A, meaning moon. So these were the Caucasian moon worshipers. Anytime you look at the, the flags of these people, they've got the Lord moon or the goddess moon on the flag. On the Turkish flag, they've got the, this moon, and they have it, and that was the female deities of the ancient world. Because they prayed to the moon, according to Renenge, some of the Caucasian people call their mountains Gog and the highest points of their mountains Magog. That was the Caucasus Mountains. And it's going to be more than Armenia that attacks the world. This is what it was in the ancient world. Magog means, Magog means region of Gog. The second son of Japheth, Genesis 10 2, 1, Corinth, 1 Chronicles 1 and 5. Noble, K-N-O-B-E-L, was a historian. You can get a lot of this out of the McClinic and Strong Encyclopedias. Noble says that Magad comes from the Sanskrit Ma or Maha, Ma or Maha. Let me read that again. Noble says that Magad comes from the Sanskrit Ma or Maha, great, and the Persian word signifying mountain, it means great mountain, along the lines of Babylon, right? Signifying mountain, in which case the reference would be to the Caucasian range between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. The terms Gog, G-H-O-G-H, and Moghef, M-O-G-H-E-F, M O G H E F are still applied to the to some of the heights of that range. Hitzig, H I T Z I G, another historian, connects the first syllable with the Coptic Ma, meaning place, and Maha, land, and the second Persian root Koka, K O K A. Koka 
recall Kokov, the origin of the Caucasus or Caucasian mountains, meaning the moon. As though the term had reference to the moon worshippers, may I recall to your mind that Allah was the Lord Moon in the ancient world. And the moon being the ruler of the darkness, Paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, uh, against spiritual wickedness in high places. When Solomon allowed his wives to keep their moon goddesses, he built the high places outside the cities to keep their moon goddesses. And against the rulers of the darkness, what ruled the darkness in the first chapter of Genesis was the Lord Moon. In high places, or the goddess, moon goddess, you can apply Lord Moon or, or a moon goddess to the, to the moon because it was androgynous. In high places and those who love to shine above others in the darkness, let me remind you the Bible says God resisted the proud and the only place a man can shine is when he is in the dark. He cannot shine in the light, can he? You have to be in the dark. You have to be in sin to shine. God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. God makes war against those who shine above others or spiritual Babylonians of the proud and they're in darkness. God will make war with unrepentant nations, spiritual Gog and Magog. God set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Let's go back to Ezekiel, the 38th chapter. I'm going to read verse 3 again and say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws. That's very important. When those old ancient kings, particularly the, the, these pagan kings, they would, the Assyrian kings, the Babylonian kings, they'd conquer a kingdom, and they would go in, they would come cut the thumbs, and you're going to see this in the first chapter of Judges. They would come the thumbs and the great toes off of their pagan enemies. You cannot hold a spear. You cannot string a bow without your thumbs. You can't do anything without your thumbs, trying to grab something like so. You need to sit down. You're kind of disrupting things, walking around. Well, you don't need to be walking around. You can't hold a hammer. You can't build anything without your... Your great toes, your big toes, you don't have any balance. So you couldn't be, you could not be going to war with somebody. They would cut off their thumbs and their big toes. You can see that in, in the Judges, the first chapter. And they would put hooks in their jaws. They'd run a chain or a rope through their jaw, out their mouth, tie them up under their table and throw them some bread once in a while and that would be some great king that they had conquered so that was the embarrassment God says you talk about conquering when I conquer you I'll put hooks in your jaws I'll put hooks in thy jaws and I will bring forth all thine army horses and horsemen all of them clothed with all sorts of armor even a great company with bucklers a buckler was a shield, was a shield, and they would wear chains of armor as as their vests as they'd go against their enemy, and shields all of them handling swords. Now he's going to talk about all of these nations coming together to attack Israel. I'm not going to be surprised if they come together not too far away because this is talking about the end of all things. But when he says horses, the only way they knew of expressing uh, one army attacking another was horses, bucklers, and shields, and bows, and spears. This could be, at the end of time, it could be saying tanks, nuclear power, 
It could use all of the things about rockets and uh, rifles. And here's what he says is going to attack Israel. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya. All of these are going to come together in a confederacy as one nation because they're all going to be Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya. Persia is over here. This is Iran, Ethiopia, Libya. This is Libya right here. I always remember Libya by that gulf right there, and Ronald Reagan put a sanction against Libya and blockaded this this gulf here to keep uh, the crazy guy, what was his name? Uh, Omar huh? Omar Gaddafi. Yeah, keep Gaddafi at bay. And he sanctioned them and stopped them from getting things shipped into them. Now, Persia was a, is Iran. Ethiopia is Ethiopia. With Libya and all with them, all them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his bands and the house of Togarma of the north quarters. Gomer, which would be part of Russia. Togarma here. Togarma. This would be upper Ethiopia. He's describing what is called Syria, Russia, Turkey. That's what he's describing with these ancient names. Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togarma of the north quarters and all his bands and many people with thee. Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. And after many days, now this is very important, this next verse. After many days thou shalt be visited. Visited doesn't mean they're going to have, uh, say, well, let's put out some coffee and cookies for them. Visited means, it either means we're going to visit with the sword or with war or with peace. But there's not talking about peace here. After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years thou shalt come in unto the land that is brought back from the sword. Who has had the sword upon them at this point? Israel. There in Luke 21, 24. The Jews shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the Gentile rule over them is done. So this is talking about Israel being brought back from the sword. They were never brought back from the sword until May 14, 1948. That's when they became a nation for the first time and all the time before that, they've been under the rule of Gentiles all the way back to Babylon when Nebuchadnezzar comes in and crushes Jerusalem and they've been under all this rule and that's what I gave you. This, These are the nations that have ruled Israel on this paper, God's judgment on Israel and Judah right here. That's that paper right there. This is all the nations have ruled them until May 14, 1948. They have never come back from the sword until 1948. So when this says they're going to come back from the sword, this has to be later than 1948 that all these nations under these ancient pagan names is going to attack Israel. Maybe God had Ezekiel write these down with their pagan names to keep the world blind, except for the believers who's willing to study it. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, with all of them with shield and helmet. You could say with their fighting gear that you see these soldiers on that are going overseas. You could say with their uh, all these rifles they have and all of these super rockets they have you could name that but see they having to put it in the vernacular of the ancient world Gomer and all his bands in the house of Togarma and all the north quarters 
and all his bands and many people with thee. And he goes, I left off in verse 8. After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years, in the latter years, in the latter times. Thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, that's Israel, and is gathered out of many people. They started gathering into Israel from all over the world as soon as they were declared a nation. There were so many coming back, they had to put a restriction on how many could come into Israel. All the Jews couldn't come back from all over the world. And is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, and it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. God says, I will be a wall of fire about them. Now, they're dwelling safely right now because... They are armed to the hilt with nuclear power. Our friend Mike, who went over there and worked with Mossad, which is the anti-terrorist organization, said they have 800 missiles, at least somewhere in that range. He said they, they will, if they fire a missile, he called it, he said that missile will go to what he called an apogee. He said that's as high as it will go, the apogee. I don't know exactly how to spell that. A P O J E E A P O G E E. The apogee is where the missile will go to a certain point, and it's up here, and it can fire off 15 to 20 nuclear warheads. That's why those nations don't attack them outright. If they have a crazy, a crazy guy like who was the guy's? What was the guy's name, Mike? Do you remember him? He, huh? Um, Achmadi the Jod said, I will do an attack on Israel as soon as we as the, as the Persians or the Iranians, as soon as we get warheads, I will attack them outright. They don't have to provoke me. We're going after the land that they possessed. We possessed it for 400 years. Our brothers, our Arab brothers, when I say Arab, I don't mean exactly Arab. I mean the Hebrew word. Arab, which means mixed. Our Arab brothers had their land stolen from them, and we will attack them outright. So if Iran gets, if they have an Ahmad of Dajjad as their president, he said, I will attack them outright. And Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister or the president, whichever one he is, of Israel said, I will attack them as soon as they attack us. There's so many threats going on over there. This is not going to stop. There is no answer to this. The Arab peoples possessed the land from 1517 until 1917. And then the, the, uh, they had this, this edict that they would said this would become a neutralized land and in this this was going on until 1948 and when it uh, about the Balfour Declaration when it expired in 1948 May 14th the the National Council met at Tel Aviv which was for years was the capital city of Israel, and they declared Israel a nation under the president under the pressure of Harry Truman, the president of the United States. And Harry Truman is a hero in Israel because he pressured the world and told all the world, "We'll put sanctions on you, and you won't even get supplies from us." And the world was pressured into declaring Israel a nation. The only thing is, in the United Nations. All the Arab peoples vote against Israel being a nation. For as they're concerned, Israel is not a nation. They say that land belonged to us for 400 years, and it's ours. And the Bible says it belongs to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his descendants. We're headed towards something serious. The Bible says so. Now, let's keep reading here. Thou shalt ascend. Well, let me read finish up verse 8 Israel is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel which have been always waste they were waste for years Israel was called a wasteland 
until they begin to farm it again in 1948. They found out Israel has the richest land in the world and produces far above what the size of their land is, which is the less than the size of New Jersey. But it is brought forth out of the nations. That is a very significant statement. They're brought out of all the nations of the world to come back to Israel. That has never happened until 1948. They were under the rule of all these people. All, I can't, don't have time to go through this. Maybe I'll go through that next week. When they were overthrown in 70 A.D. by the Roman general Titus, his father was Vespasian, they've never been free until 1948. So they're going to come back from the sword, and they're brought forth from the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. How are they going to dwell safely? Because God's going to be their protector. And thou shalt ascend and come like a storm. Who? All those nations, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, Gomer, Togarma, they're going to come like a storm against Israel. And what does it mean they're going to ascend? Israel has a high elevation. They're going to ascend against Israel who has a high elevation. Even ascend is an important word. And come like a storm, thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land. Thou and all thy bands and many people with thee. And he's talking to Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, Gomer, Togarma, and all of their bands and the people that are with them in any kind of peace alliance. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind and thou shalt think an evil thought and God says I'm going to cause all these nations around Israel to come to that evil thought and thou shalt say I will go up to the land of unwalled villages talking about Israel and I will go to them that are at rest that dwell safely all of them dwelling without walls it says the same thing in Zechariah the second chapter they won't have walls around them, but they will have a fire surrounding them, and the fire will be God. To take a spoil, a spoil was what you get when you go in and you devastate a land or a ship, and you take the spoil with you. Take a spoil and take a prey to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. That's never been true in Israel till this current society that's there now that began in 1948. And particularly important is the War of 67, the Six-Day War from June 5th to June 10th, where they threw out the Jordanians, and Israel has been an independent nation ever since. First time since 586 B.C., when they were carried away by Nebuchadnezzar. Sheba and Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, Sheba and Dedan. Here's Dedan, Sheba, since here somewhere. Sabata, Sabta, Sheba's down here. This is all the Arabian Peninsula, Tarshish. Tarshish, they put this over here. They're not sure that's Tarshish. Sheba, Dedan, and all these are people surrounding Israel. All right. Tarshish and all the young lions. A young lion was a fighting force. That's what they called it. All the young lions thereof shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey to carry away silver and gold? take away cattle and goods. It would be different words if it was today. It's not talking about cattle and goods. It's talking about whatever they have and possess. And take a great spoil. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shall thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts against Israel. 
He's talking to the people of Persia, Ethiopia, Gomer, Togarma, in the early part of that chapter. He's talking to these people that are surrounding Israel. Are you not going to come up to Israel, come up to the elevation and attack them? Thus saith the Lord God in that day, verse 14, When my people Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north ports, thou and many people with thee, Syria, Turkey, and all the rest of these people. And all of them riding upon horses. What have I said? Riding in tanks. And a great company and a mighty army is going to attack Israel. They've never collectively attacked Israel before. They haven't had a chance to. Babylon and Persia and Greece and Rome have had them in captivity for 2,600 years. So it's not talking about something that's already happened. It shall happen in the future. And thou shalt come in against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. Going to be millions going to come against Israel. And it shall be in the latter days, in the last days, in the la at the end of the last 2,000 years, I will bring thee, I will bring you. God says, I'm going to do the bringing. I'm put it in your hearts to attack Israel because I'm going to deliver them. And watch what he says he's going to do. I will bring them against my land. I own it. God says that in the 26th chapter of Leviticus. The land is mine. I'll bring, I will do the bringing. They're not going to do this on their own. I'm going to put it in their minds to cause them to attack Israel. That the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, at your destruction before their eyes. Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel? Isn't that you, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal? Which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against my people Israel? Didn't I say that? I'm going to do the bringing. And I love this next verse. And it came to pass... At the same time, when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury will come up in my face. I'm going to get red in the face at everyone who attacks my people. I'm going to go into a rage against the world to protect my people, the church. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. So that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. That's going to be when he's coming back to defend his people not just literal Israel but the church and the mountains shall be thrown down remember a mountain was the capital city he's not talking about picking up Pike's Peak and throw it on the ground or Mount Everest and throwing it down he's talking about cutting down the ruling people of the world and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground do I have much time to have Mike ten, ten. not much I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God, and every man's sword shall be against his brother, and I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. Plead, rube, I will fight against Israel's enemies. Is that about literal Israel? Well, yes. Is that about the church? Yes. I believe the church is under attack with all this false doctrine that's in the churches in America. All the Baptists, Pentecostals, Charismatics, the church is under attack. And God's going to have to defend us. And the church is spiritual Israel, and we are being attacked right now. I can't pull it all together. I know that literal Israel is going to have to join the church. If there's a remnant that belongs to God in literal Israel, 
He's going to have to convict their hearts and cause them to believe repentance and death to self and daily cross and self-denial and Christmas is pagan and most of them already believe that. I was watching a special the other night. Uh, it was on TV or on the internet. And this guy was asking all these people, what do you think about Jesus Christ in Israel? Most of them don't have the foggiest idea who Jesus is. If there is a remnant there, I would like to be a part of preaching to those people to bring them to understanding of the Bible. Mike, the fellow that would go over there, that worked with Mossad over there, and he was working with them for years, he said, you have a cult following over there, Jim, because he took 400 of our messages over to a rabbi over there who was converted to this message through my teaching. said he threw all his books away and started listening to my tapes. And he was mailing these DVDs throughout all of Israel. He was, he was really believing in what we were teaching. I hope we had people contacting us from over there had a young Jewish girl, uh, can't remember her name. Huh? Hadassah. Oh, Hadassah. Hadassah. She was writing to us. I had a young, he had a young guy that said he was a Palestinian and we could not contact him or say his name or send him anything. They had found this young Palestinian boy, I think he said he was about 14 years old, and he had an MP3 on him, and he had one of my messages on that, on the MP3. Where in the world he got it, I don't know. I would like to be able to preach to those people there and tell them who Jesus actually is, that he is the Messiah. The Bible teaches that. Mike said they don't know anything about how the Old Testament connects with the New. Well, I want to teach them how it connects because everything that's teaching here is taught in the New Testament. Now let's continue reading. I will plead against this Gog and Magog, or this chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. It's going to be Satan leading these people in their hearts. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the people, the many people that are with him, and overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself and I will be known in the eyes of many nations and they shall know that I am the Lord. God is not going to be the loser in this. He's going to be the winner. Then if you go into the next chapter, he's talking about the same thing. Therefore, thou son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn thee back and leave but the sixth part of thee and will cause thee to be come from the north parts and bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cause you to do this. This is not something they're going to do by their own thing. God says, I'm going to put it in your minds to attack Israel. And this has never happened before. So when we look at all these people in the ancient world, God uses their ancient names. So perhaps, perhaps he wanted to do this, confuse people who read the Bible that are unwilling to find out who these people are. It's Turkey. It's Assyria. It's Arabia. It's Ethiopia. It's Egypt. It's all of these Arab people, these sons of Japheth, are these Caucasians, the sons of Japheth and the sons of Ham are going to come up and attack the son Shem or the Semitic people. There's so much to this. I'm thinking, why did God make Shem, the second born, the inheritor of all of Israel? He evidently loved the second born, just like he loved Abel, just like he loved Jacob, the second born. All through the Old Testament, you got the second born as being blessed. And you have, what amazes me is God said that Adam knew his wife Eve after Abel was killed by, Abel was killed by Cain. And she 
conceived and bare another son in the place of Abel whom Cain slew. That is a picture of the church or spiritual Israel. We're going to be attacked also. Look over here in Daniel. All of these men are aligned in the Bible according to when they appeared. When you see Isaiah, when you see Isaiah, Isaiah preached to northern Israel for, for 50 years. And he preached to northern Israel in the mid-700s before Christ. So Isaiah in the Bible comes first as far as the major prophets are concerned. Isaiah was here in the mid-700s. Isaiah. And he was here in 722 preaching to Israel, B.C., when the Assyrians come in and they carry northern Israel away into captivity in 722. He preached to somewhere around 712 B.C. And then Jeremiah is next and that's why you'll find Jeremiah preaching after Isaiah. That's why Isaiah comes before Jeremiah in the Bible because it's chronologically laid out. Jeremiah preaches from around 625, 626, 25, 626, 25 to 586. This is after Isaiah. And then, and then Daniel, well, excuse me, Ezekiel comes after that. And so believe that Ezekiel was carried away into captivity in the second, perhaps the second deportation, somewhere around 597 B.C. And it's believed that Daniel was carried away into the captivity somewhere about that same time. So these two men are over in Babylon. They're over in Babylon. And then... You have these, these are called the major prophets along with one other prophet and that was Moses. You had five major prophets and then when you get into these minor prophets, I don't know what I got O-N, uh, you get into these guys, these guys were over here in Babylon prophesying about what God's doing back over here. Jeremiah stayed in Israel and Isaiah was in Israel. But Ezekiel and Daniel were in Babylon when they're prophesying. You've got to know who these guys were and where they were when they're prophesying. And if you look at the first parts of their... Am I out of time? I'm out of time. We're going to go through more of this, and I'm going to go some more into chapter 39, because you're still with Gog and Magog, and God says, I'm against you, Assyrian... It's just the Assyrians, Babylonians under another name. It's their first names where they, when they were first come out of the ark. It's just a battle between Shem, Ham, and Japheth. That's what it's a battle for. And it's all against Shem, and he was the blessed of God. And the Israelites come out of that. I'm out of time. I'll come back. We'll talk more about this next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for truth. God, help us to understand this book. Unravel it. Reveal it to us so we can see what's going on. Thank you for truth. Fight our battles for us. We're certainly your spiritual Israel, and we're under attack now with these false preachers preaching these lies in these pulpits. Thank you for truth. Lord, we subject ourselves to you. We submit to you as much as you will cause us to. Fight our battles. We'll praise you for Christ's sake. Amen. I hope you understand Ezekiel a little better, especially that 38th chapter. But I couldn't show you that without this map. There's no way you could know it.
Hey, David. What are you doing? Sorry I couldn't come today. I just was That's too sick this morning. Oh, well, I figured that. It was way too sudden. Anytime you're not here, you're yeah. sick. I may not even make it through the year. You know? Are you really bothered by this? Yeah. I'm just dying right now. Well, I wish there's something I could do. I'll be praying for you. I really mean I'm fit to call me out.